So this week has been kind of an interesting week for me because Brian's officially on, on his medical leave and all the responsibilities that were going to be given to me have fallen on my shoulders. And so I've been able to kind of uh, walk through that this week. Um, and so far, things have been going pretty well. Um, we did the, the midweek Bible studies. Um, the, we watched the movie. Um, I've been working on, we're going to go through James. We started our first week of James for the Sunday morning Bible study. And I've been working on um, the sermons for the fruit of the Spirit. And my schedule has been able to flex enough for me to, um, to actually do more hours here, and that's been good. Um, so everything was going according to plan, and until yesterday afternoon, um, I went to work on my sermon, and it was not done. And I realized I had a lot of work to do on it. And so that was a little bit um, frustrating for me, as I, I, was, I didn't have a whole lot of patience, because I... I've been working all week on stuff, and I thought I was close enough done with the, with the sermon, and it turned out that I wasn't. And so I prayed about it, and I realized as I was praying that I was actually living out an object lesson, lesson for the sermon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the process for, for writing a sermon and working through it is long, and it takes time, and it takes intentionality, it takes effort, um, and I was being impatient, and I realized that... Um, I needed to, to be a little bit patient with the process, and it was going to take up more of my Saturday than I wanted it to, um, but I realized that I, was not, I wasn't being patient, and patience is actually this week's fruit of the Spirit that we're going to be going through. Um, so, so we're going to talk about patience today, um, and uh, so in order to do that, let's open up to 1 Timothy 1, um, verses 12 through 17, if you have that. It's also in your bulletin, um, and uh, I'll read that for us. 1 Timothy chapter 1 starting in verse 12, reading through verse 17. I give thanks to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he considered me faithful, appointing me to the ministry, even though I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an arrogant man. But I receive mercy because I acted out of ignorance and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, and I am the worst of them. But I receive mercy for this reason, that in me, the worst of them, Christ Jesus might demonstrate his extraordinary patience as an example to those who would believe in him for eternal life. Now to the King, eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you that you're here with us, and I thank you that you're so good, and your presence is so wonderful. I just, I confess, God, that sometimes I'm not patient. And I just pray that you give me patience today as, as, I, as I share from your word. And I pray that you give me the words to say, because my words can fail. And uh, I can be impatient or rushed, and I can say things that aren't good, God, but I just pray right now that you guide me as I share from your word. I pray also that, that you be here and you, um, you interpret the word to each of the hearts of those who are hearing, that all who listen to this will be impacted by your word, be drawn closer to you, convinced more of your love, and drawn into Christ-like behavior as you sanctify by your Holy Spirit. I thank you that you're so good um, and... You're so good. In Jesus' name, amen. So, in order to unpack this passage, it's always helpful to understand the context. And, um, and there's a lot of context we could dig into as, as exploring what is behind and around this passage, but one of the most important things, I think, in understanding this passage, as we see it talks about the extraordinary patience of Jesus, is to understand what Paul means when he calls himself the worst of all sinners. And so in order to do so, I wanted to take a little bit of time and look at Paul's background um, and, and kind of get a hint as to, yeah, what does it mean? How, how bad was Paul actually? Was he, was he that bad of a sinner? He's clearly writing scripture for the churches. He couldn't have been that bad. Um, and so let's look, uh, I'll, I'll do a brief summary of what we see Paul's previous life was before he was an apostle and a minister to the Gentiles. So reading through Acts, we get different hints, and also through some of the, the different letters, of what his life looked like. Um, one of the first mentions of Paul 
was at a martyr uh, when they killed Stephen. It was one of the first martyrs that we know of. And it says in Acts that Paul was there and that the people who stoned Stephen actually laid their garments at Paul's feet. And in Acts 8, 1, it says that Saul, his name was previously Saul, so I'll say Saul and Paul, but just know that it's the same person. And Saul approved of his execution, and there arose on that day a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem. So Jesus had been crucified, he had been resurrected, the gospel was spreading, and there was evangelists sharing the good news with people, and this met a huge conflict with the church that was, or I guess the the Jewish system that was set up. And Paul was one of them that was in that system. He was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was a great student. He was excelling beyond those of his peers. And he was really, really zealous for the traditions and the religion that he was a part of. And one of the things that was very significant is they did not like Jesus as the Messiah. That was a huge stumbling block for them. And so being the devoted... um, the the devoted student and and religious person that Paul was, or Saul at the time, he decided that he would dedicate himself um, to defending God's name by persecuting the church. And so we see that he did this. In Galatians 1.13, it says, I intensely persecuted God's church and tried to destroy it. In Acts 22, he says, I persecuted this way, so the Christians, to death arresting and putting both men and women in jail, as both the high priest and the whole council of elders can testify about me. Later it says, I actually did this in Jerusalem and locked up many of the saints in prison since I had received authority from the chief priests. When they were put to death, I was in agreement against them. I cast my vote against them. In all the synagogues, I often punished them and tried to make them blaspheme since I was terribly enraged at them. I pursued them even to foreign cities. So there from these verses, we get this picture of someone who's so devoted to their perception of God that they would murder, and at least approve of the murder um, of Christians. And so Paul was somebody who would personally go into people's homes and take them to prison. And it says he punished them to make them blaspheme God. And that was in the synagogues. And so Paul was, was very clearly a terrible person, right? He was somebody who was actually, who would cause us to fear if he was around, um, who had no issue and felt religious justification in the murder of of people. And so that is who Saul is. And that's why Saul can say, or Paul um, can say that he was the worst of all Christians because he truly lived out a lifestyle that was in direct opposition to Jesus. He was enraged at Jesus and did not like him. And the closest thing that he could express that rage to Jesus through was Jesus' followers, and he did that. And one of the questions that I had in thinking about that story is where was Jesus while that was happening? It seems as though Jesus does nothing, in a sense. We don't hear of any particular moments where Christ stepped in to stop Paul until a certain point. And, uh, and we, we, don't, we don't even get the satisfaction sometimes we, we like when the bad guy is taken out of a story, when they're wiped out, when they're killed, and that's our satisfaction we get, and oh, fine, it's finally over. We don't get that in the story either. So what was Jesus doing while Paul was actively in sin and actually kidnapping people and approving of their murder and punishing them and trying to get them to blaspheme God? we see that Jesus, instead of stepping in to punish or to kill or destroy or to to end Paul, Saul's persecution of the church, we see that Jesus chose to display his extraordinary patience. Oxford Languages defines patience as the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, trouble, or suffering without getting angry or upset. And I think that's a fair definition. Um, The Greek word is, is similar. The Greek word is macrothumia. And macro means, means large or long, and thumia is anger or passion. And so you can kind of think of it as the opposite of being quick-tempered. It's being slow to anger. And so there's three aspects, as we saw in the definition, and we kind of see in, in the Greek word, there's three aspects to patience. There's some difficulty, some, some struggle, something that has to be endured. Then there's a reaction of tolerance or endurance of that thing, 
And that tolerance or that endurance is without sin or anger. And so in the case of our passage today, Saul was that difficulty. He was that thing that had to be endured. He was actively sinning in opposition to Jesus, and Jesus was the one then to exhibit a quiet endurance towards Saul as Saul continued to sin. So Jesus had every right to step in and stop Paul or Saul, but he didn't. Rather, he waited knowing of his future as a proponent of the gospel. In Galatians 1.15, we see this. God, who from my mother's womb set me apart and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son to me. So we know that Paul, when he was in his womb, was set apart for this, was set apart to have the son be revealed to him and ultimately to be uh, an apostle to the Gentiles. And so Jesus knew that and was waiting patiently for the right time for that. And so this story of Jesus' patience towards Saul, towards Paul, has three applications for our own lives. The first is that just like Jesus showed Paul mercy by being patient, so also does he show us mercy by being patient. And that it's meant to lead us to repentance and salvation. Romans 2, 3 through 4 says, Do you think any, any one of you who judges those who do such things yet do the same, that you will escape God's judgment? Or do you despise the riches of his kindness, restraint, and patience, not recognizing that God's kindness is intended to lead you to repentance? So here Paul refers to the idea that God's patience is actually postponing judgment. So the reality is just like Paul, who is in sin, each one of us have been in sin. We've done things that are worthy of God's punishment. God is utterly holy. He's so separate from us that our own sin requires punishment. It requires that separation, and it actually necessitates God's wrath. But one of the graces of God is that he gives us time. He allows for us to be drawn to him even while we're in sin before we truly know him. And so if you're saved, you know that Jesus gave you that grace as he patiently waited for you and led you to come to him. And if you aren't saved, the Bible tells us that, the, that at any time you have peace and you're not experiencing the wrath of God or that hasn't happened yet, it means that God is showing patience towards you and kindness, making room for you to turn towards him in repentance. <laughs> and what Paul stresses in today's passage is incredible, that Paul was a terrible person. He was basically a murderer in a sense. He was a kidnapper, and he was, he was just terrible. Yet God waited for him. And how much more is this time of grace for you and for me an expression of his patience towards us? So Jesus loves you, and one expression of his love is his quiet patience. Sometimes when he might be being quiet, it's actually him, his patience towards you or he's waiting for you to surrender to his unrelenting love. And Jesus is also our example in what it looks like to show that patience towards others. The second application is just that, that just like Jesus was patient with Saul, the worst of all sinners, and is patient with you and me, also terrible sinners, we are to be patient with others who, guess what? They're sinners too. So in, in, our, in our, you know, our system of an obstacle to be endured, met with endurance and patience without sinning, oftentimes people around us are that thing that requires endurance. And the reality is it can be hard to deal with people. And every time we have a relationship with any person, our own sin and their sin get in the way of us having a, a perfect relationship, which means that patience is necessary. There's always going to be some sort of difficulty, some sort of hardship, in any relationship you have with a broken person that's going to necessitate patience by the Holy Spirit. And just like Jesus tolerated the difficulty of Paul persecuting him through his followers, right, when Jesus finally confronted Paul, he said, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? It was directly at Jesus Christ himself. So just as Paul was persecuting him, Jesus withheld from expressing his anger or his wrath and so are we, too, by the Holy Spirit, to tolerate the difficulty of others without expressing our anger or our sin. And what does that look like? 
Well, there's an example of a little bit of what this looks like in, in the Old Testament, in the book of Hosea. One example comes, yeah, from the book of Hosea, a point in history where God's people had abandoned him, in a sense. They left God for other, other gods and, in a sense, broke the covenant bond between them. And as a symbol of God's patient faithfulness, he actually had a prophet, Hosea, commit himself to an unfaithful wife. And uh, there's a point, it, it's a little bit dicey exactly what happens in the story because sometimes it can be thought of as a retelling of what happened. But basically, Hosea was told to go buy back Gomer, who was unfaithful to him, as a display of God's faithful patience to his own people. And for Hosea, that's what it meant to live in that patience, to actually endure someone who was unfaithful, had proven unloving, and broke the covenant, and had every reason for that relationship to be separate forever. But because God had special plans in that moment, as a display of his love for Israel, he had Hosea take back Gomer. He redeemed her. And I can't imagine what that would have been like to be in that situation, have someone basically become unloyal, and I have to be the one commissioned by God to prove that loyalty in patience. Yet that's exactly what the patience of God is. He does that over and over again. He did it to, to Israel, he did it to Paul, and he does it to us. And the final application is a little similar, but a little bit different. In Romans 8, 23 through 25, we see this. We wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes in what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So notice this form of patience isn't oriented towards a person. Rather, it's kind of oriented towards life itself. That our future hope is something which we endure to get, right? The fact that we aren't living in that hope, the glorious hope of being unified with God in perfection forever, the fact that we're not in that is reason to be patient and endure. So God is a beautiful example of patience, and we're instructed to endure the trials of this world, all the sin we interact with, both the sin of people that we have relationships with and the sin, or the, I guess the, the brokenness that has resulted from the whole sin of the world, living in a fallen world where there's pain and there's death. We have to endure that. We get to endure that with patience as we follow in the example of our Savior. We're to be slow to anger, slow to retaliate, and to remain steadfast in our endurance until the race is complete. And what does this look like? Another example that came to mind was from the book of Job. Most of us are really familiar with that story. Job was set up really well. He had, he had kids. He had a lot of wealth. And, and suddenly one day God took that all from him or allowed that to be taken from him. And, and he was left without his kids, without his wealth. He was struck, struck in with boils. Everything that he had, it was flipped completely upside down. And it was so bad that he was re even recommended by his wife to just curse God and die. That was the recommendation. It's like, what your situation is so crummy, just end it. And that's how bad his situation was. But a good portion of the book, what do we see Job doing? He doesn't accuse God of evil. He, of course, gets to sit in the misery of it. It's not comfortable to have all that happen, but he didn't accuse God of evil. And at one point, he does challenge God, but apologizes for that. And in the end of the book, we don't see that God requires him to make a sacrifice like he does his friends who gave him bad advice. So Job shows us an example of great patience in the face of life circumstances that are truly miserable. And most of us don't have to endure difficulty to, to that extent, um, but it's an example to us because none of us are living a life that isn't necessitating patient endurance of difficulties of life. So altogether, Paul reminds us of the root behind the fruit of the spirit of patience, that God himself is extraordinarily patient. That's the reason behind every one of the fruit of the spirit is that God is like that himself. God is loving. God is patient. God is kind. Um, God is joyful. And so we see that in the whole entirety of scriptures, we see God's example in that of his patience. And so one, there's several ways in which we can react to that. And one is to turn to him in belief and to recognize his patience as a beautiful thing as he's drawing us to us, as he's quietly waiting for us, in a sense, to come to him in repentance and receive the, the salvation that comes through faith in Jesus Christ 
and to have our sins forgiven and no longer be bound by sin and by shame. And the second reaction to God's patience is to treat others with patience as we have to deal with with a broken world that we're required to follow in the example empowered by the Holy Spirit, to be patient with one another, to quietly endure other people who are, who are acting out in sin. And third is to live in patience as we wait for the realization of the hope that we hold in Christ, that we're not fully living in that yet, and it requires patience and endurance as we wait for that blessed hope. I talked about it a few weeks ago, the joy that we have in the hope of eternity that requires patience as we, get to, as we get to walk through this life right now. And two weeks ago, I did share on the, fr- the fruit of the Spirit of joy, and I mentioned a working definition of the fruit. The fruit of the Spirit is a cohesive set of virtues that are created, nourished, and grown by the Spirit alone, as made evident by the willful acts of one unified with the Lord Jesus Christ. And as we've seen today, patience is evidenced in God's character. It's who he is. And we could explore many other examples where God's patience is evidence, particularly through Israel's history. But it's important to see this part of the fruit of the Spirit as something that is natural for God. This is something that's natural to Him to be patient with us. And it actually flows from Him, so it's fitting that it's the fruit of the Spirit. And if it's a part of God's behavior, um, it's a part of God's behavior as He lives through us. So we're supernaturally empowered to be patient with others, in all our circumstances, just as we're instructed to do so. So this week, I hope that we remember that part of the command to walk by the Spirit includes being patient with each other, being patient with fellow believers, being patient with unbelievers. There isn't a thing the Bible outlines for us not to be patient with. We're told to be patient. And by God's power, it's actually made easy sometimes. It's difficult, but the Holy Spirit can make that easy. So I pray that we let the the patience of God flow through us as we interact with others and face the obstacles of life. So with that short sermon, I'll pray for us. (laughs) Dear Heavenly Father, I do thank you for how patient you are and just how loving, God, that, that your love is expressed through your patience as you wait for us to come to you. I thank you that Paul is a beautiful example of that patience, that there isn't any person that's too bad for your patience, that you decide, oh, nope, I'm done and just give up on them, God. But you're patient, and you're waiting for them, and you're leading them. You're giving them grace and time to come to you. And so I pray that anybody who hears this that hasn't come to you, I pray they can recognize that that any good time they've experienced, any peace, is a sign that God is waiting for them to come to repentance and come to the beautiful salvation of what it means to be unified with you through faith in Christ. I thank you that you're patient with me even when I I stumble through my life and my job and figuring things out. And I just thank you for the patience of those around me as they they get to deal with someone who is a sinner and who actually necessitates others to be patient with me. I just pray that you, you, uh, you reveal to everyone in this room your patience to them and guide them to walk in patience this week um, and just celebrate your love and your joy as they do so. In Jesus' name, amen.